All right, we'll get this party started. It looks like we're just mostly talking to you know, crazy people, I know this, but see a few um, new faces, so this is all good. So uh, I'm going to kick it off by just kind of quickly saying, which is, I hope quickly, saying kind of the, the framework of all the things that we're trying to do, and then we're going to go through Melissa, and then to, where's Joanne? Joanne and talk about kind of the newest project, which is Incubator Farm. And so, the thing I'd like to notice here is that strengthening communities and transforming lives, people kind of know we do this, you know, we teach, we do workforce, but we do better and better chapter in the economic development pension because there's work to be done. All right, so a lot of stuff here. A little bit of my background, I got my Aggie comments from I went to, I'm not from, but you know, Colorado State University, who is the other school, and I went to oversee the regional agricultural economic development, so I'm very much thinking about the system, the food system, how to really improve lives for farmers and ranchers. And with me, we got um, Scott Creed, where are you? I saw his hand a second ago. He just got up. We got Joanne Slingerland, where are you? Got, there you are, Susan Cage. Jack Schmidt couldn't make today, but I'm feeling well. Melissa Hinton, Amanda Winchester, our new faculty. I'll slow down a little bit, like people get settled a little bit. Welcome, everybody. So uh, I'm, I'm the president of the college. Now you have to stand in a certain place, probably. <laughs> I've got to stand right here. Okay, so um, so we're just kind of, I'm starting off by just kind of telling the different things that we do a little bit. So people ask about a Rocky Mountain complex. When is that going to be built? Hopefully we'll break ground on that uh, sometime next year. And that'll be... Um, I can be louder. I turn up my volume. Um, two indoor arenas and uh, some seating on one of them. Uh, meat processing lab there. So that'll be great. Because we have this big workforce need for that, obviously. We have a mobile slaughter and a mobile cut and wrap, and we have a consortium with a couple of the colleges in the state, talking to various people to try to really serve that workforce need. Um, what else we got? Okay, what you're going to kind of hear about today is more of kind of what we're doing in Heritage Ag and food, at what, what we call the Alpine Science Institute. People used to call it the Sinks Canyon Center, or UW's old extension site. Um, we have other things that tie in. We have a culinary and hospitality program that's really excellent in Jackson. So that food, craft beef, craft food, to enhance value. Things. And of course, there's a college, I think, a really strong in entrepreneurship. We do have a business park um, and business programs. And so that's a little bit kind of what we're doing. Scott, Scott's back, so he's our entrepreneurial agribusiness person to that really teach those uh, useful business skills while you're learning ag. Our lead in really the heritage, um, food and local food is, now we've got the whole team, but we got Joanne Slingerman, and like you said, we got um, Ethan Page, and our meats person, Amanda Winchester. So you can see we're building out the ag program, right? Um, so ag is number three sector in Wyoming. And so the big thing is that ag economists when I looked at the, the local amount of money in Fremont County, it's serious dollars. Sometimes people put poo poo, poo, poo poo ag, and they'll say, oh, there's just not, you know, let's focus on IT, or there's got to be something that's going to save the day. But ag, ag is king in a way. This is where we have a huge potential. When you talk about how much money in the, the ag uh, supply chain in Fremont County alone, it is about, uh, $80 million annually, and most of that, as I kept trying to remember the number, something like oh, 80 or 80 something percent, you gotta memorize my numbers, or, oh, here we go, here's my numbers right here. In Fremont County, we estimate that there's a total dollar value of agricultural supply chain of 84 million, of which 58.5 is imported into the region. So if it's just a quarter of that 84 million, we can do locally and do more production and kind of feed ourselves and import less. We're talking about $21 million annually in the local ag economy. So this is 
not small numbers, right? And I think governors and people typically kind of poo-poo the ag thing because they can't get their head around it. But there's a huge potential there. And a lot of this translates into how do you capture that in the supply chain? Kind of the entrepreneurial, start your business, enhance your business, grow your business, do more things with supply chain, part of your business, this entrepreneurial agribusiness penchant that we're doing. Um, so what we're trying to do is catalyze change to make things better, right? As an institution, we could do a whole lot of mucking around, but we're trying to think, what do we need to hit on? So when we talk about meats and craft meats, there's a potential there to, to flip a switch on the market to get more. And it's complicated, right? But you have to try. There's the COVID disruptions. Um, nationally, there's more focus on soil health, sustainable ag, and heritage ag, and we're hitting that. We can't compete with some of the colleges in terms of the number of greenhouses and things they have, but I think we found our niche so we can make a difference. And then we're also trying to create new farmers and managers for that kind of retiring sector. We have to worry about the, the, the aging population and farming and ranching. And so this new farm incubator is trying to meet that need. Well, futurism is number two in the state, right? But why do you go to the state? Okay, they had natural beauty, which we have and we leverage. But nowadays, you go and food is a big part of the tourist experience, right? You enjoy eating out. You love the local experience. Food is a huge part of the tourism. You may go to Mount Rushmore and go, that's cool, let's hang out here for an hour. And the rest of the time, it's eating, what restaurant are we gonna go to, where are we gonna go to relax, what else can we do to have fun? And that translates into agritourism, which we're trying to hit hard as well. So we have a really great DuPont program. We did it for coal. DuPont County is number one in horses in the state, number of horses, number eighth in the nation. We gotta leverage that more in agritourism. Um, other thing that we need to do to attract tourists and keep them here longer is kind of beef up our main street, kind of literally. And if you can imagine more restaurants serving local food and local beef, and you know the story. Um, and so this, thus, kind of this craft meat program. How can we beef up tourism by, you know, celebrating what we do locally? Um, and, and then entrepreneurial things and add meat clients and new farmer startups. We're really trying to build the economy. It's not like we teach ag, see you later, good luck. We have to think more strategically. Um, all right, so. That's my bit. I'll pass this off to uh, Melissa. So I'm Melissa, and Brad set me up really well. Uh, CWC is looking working at a lot of different things across the local food economy, and I'm going to talk a little bit how we're supporting more of the organizational and uh, producer uh, level of things. So real quick, kind of walk through the different ways you can sell direct to consumer. You know, you got the on-farm sales. Like I sell eggs, and my neighbor stopped by, and I give her the eggs. She just has to drive there, it takes a little more time. I could also, my neighbor could buy the eggs and I can drop them off on my way to town. That takes my time, you know, we get to see each other and chat, you know, be neighborly. But it's a little more time consuming. And then you have the farmer's markets. Uh, we just talked a bunch about those in a previous session with Ernie. Um, it's a great way to meet folks and get word out that you're selling a product because it's, you know, a community event, there's often live music, um, people you haven't met before, may come by. Again, it's a little more time consuming for the producer. You gotta sit there maybe five to six hours a day. It's more time consuming for the consumer. They've gotta go on a Saturday morning when maybe they wanna be mowing the lawn. Or maybe they don't wanna be mowing the lawn, but they need to mow the lawn. <laughs> um, but they're great avenues to get word out that you're selling product locally and that you got some eggs and some lamb on um, beef. Um, then there's some more organized ways to do it. Um, there's CSAs, which are community supported egg, and that's where you buy a share at the beginning of the growing season and then you're guaranteed a certain amount of food in a box. Often that's vegetables. They don't often go into meat, so you can add meats there. And um, you know, that, that term's been around a lot, community supported, is that you're kind of giving, instead of getting like an operating loan, I grew up on a big crop and hog farm in Midwest, those farmers do a lot of operating loans, where they get a loan at the beginning of the season, buy all their seed, they pay off the loan in the fall, right, when they sell the crop. Uh, CSAs are kind of that thing, except it's your neighbors, it's your community members. They're paying at the front of the season for that share. You grow the crop, you've got the money to do it, and then you give them the crop at the end of the season. And you could translate that into meats as well. 
Another thing is called buyer's clubs. And they kind of, buyer's clubs and subscription boxes, people use them the same sometimes. Um, but it's the same thing. You are like, okay, I know my family. I've got four kids. I often buy this much fresh produce or this much meat a month. And so I'm going to sign up and tell you that I want this for the next six months. And that's great for the producer, right? You've got a guaranteed market. You know how much to grow. You know your income's coming right in. And sometimes it's organized as a club. You're part of the club. You get the stuff delivered. Sometimes it's part of subscription. You're subscribing. You're paying ahead of time. And then there's often like a centralized um, pickup location, you know, like Walmart parking lot, Riverton, Mr. D's and Lander, and the producer is coming in. And often those buyer's clubs and subscription boxes are a group of producers. Like I might just have eggs and whole chicken meat. And then my neighbor has the pork. And then someone else is making tortillas. <laughs> and we could, or the breads and the jams and then the salsas. And then all of a sudden you're filling someone's grocery list because we all like efficiency, right? I'm the type of person, when I run errands in town, I go like line them up according to, I live in Lander, how they are across town, right? I don't like to squiggle. <laughs> and people like to go to the grocery store and buy everything they want. Their milk, their eggs, their meat, their bread, and it's easy. That's harder when you're buying local because it's hard for all of us to be our own little grocery store. So the buyer's club, the subscription boxes come where you start thinking um, kind of more group with your producers. Like, what are you doing? What am I doing? Hey, you want to work together? Let's offer this service. And then also you kind of get into online ordering there too, e-commerce platforms. The other thing we really like, we, I'm assuming all of us have ordered off Amazon at least once, right? We like convenience. Um, Amazon does really well in those subscription things too, by the way, where you say, I want TV, you know, every single month it just shows up in a box. <laughs> so they know these, these selling models as well. And that's, that's a convenience for the producer and the customer, right? I don't have to think, get a phone call or text and remember to write it down that I've got to deliver eggs somewhere. It comes in automatically through like Square, which is a point of sale management system. It automatically sends this invoice to the customer and it automatically charges their credit card for me. And wow, I'm not having to do all this. I can be out with my chickens and my eggs doing what I want to do and not managing this POS system. Uh, so that's a lot of producer and customer convenience there, right? Uh, One-stop shopping, subscription boxes for the customer. Um, the producer likes the fact they have a guarantee next six months. They know what's coming for orders. They know their income. They know what customers want because they've already ordered it, right? You're not growing something that's a fresh food that all of a sudden you can't sell. And, oh, what am I going to do with all these tomatoes? Well, I guess I'm making salsa, and then I'm going to try to sell the salsa because I you know, have too many tomatoes. Um, so there's, those are two kind of uh, more organized things, and then you kind of get more into the network for storage, aggregation, and distribution. And when you add these three things together, it becomes a producer financial sustainability, because then you kind of know your income coming in, you know what the market wants, what consumers are wanting to buy, and you're working a little bit perhaps more together with other producers, and you have that financial sustainability on there. Now, the net storage aggregation distribution gets, where it starts getting tricky, right? Cold storage, um, if your meat's first, you need to do freezer storage. Aggregation is kind of what the buyer's clubs and subscription boxes are already doing. Central location pickup, bringing in all these products from different producers into one location. And then the distribution is getting it to the consumer. Uh, so it's not, say, me driving around with all my eggs to everyone's house. Uh, it's them coming to a central location and it's saving time uh, for the distribution. And then from there, you kind of run into, okay, now you got increased sales and expanded economy. And then I put up here in a little cloud, just to make sure we thought about it, was the restaurant and grocery wholesale market. So in business terms, you often have your wholesale market, you got your retail market. And retail's you know, more of the, I'm walking into Mr. D's grocery store and do my, do my grocery shopping. And wholesale is a restaurant is making an order on Cisco truck, right? And what CWC is looking at within local food and agriculture economy is how do we help, uh, in a good way, disrupt that system? You know, we love a Cisco truck. They bring in good food for us and we need that food. But how do we help restaurants um, like Brown Sugar Roastery, Roasted Bean here in Riverton, they buy local meat from Tyler and Angela McMahon out of Pavilion. How do we help them do that more and do it in a way that's efficient for them because they've got a restaurant to run. You know, they can't be running out to Pavilion, even though they might, might love Tyler and Angela, pick up their meat, 
And Kyle and Angela probably don't have a whole ton of time to always be stopping by when Amanda has a refill and brown sugar have an order. So kind of thinking about how we can be a little more efficient in um, our system here so that everyone can have increased sales, good food, and it's our own little local food economy. And within all this, CDFC's been doing a lot of different things. Uh, we've been working with the farmers markets and how we can um, help support them. We're looking at an online farmers market, um, helping Lander Valley Farmers Market do a Fremont County wide online market. So that's kind of a crossover, right? From farmers market to online ordering. You order it online and you can pick up your box at the farmers market. So that kind of takes away some time there. Um, we're also looking at how we can help with some cold storage in this area and, uh, and a more of a producer co-op, we might end up being that type of legal framework to own the cold storage and the aggregation distribution um, effort there. And also there's a big need that's been identified here for vendor liability insurance and it's ex expensive for an individual to hold such a policy. If you think about health insurance, if I'm having my own health insurance policy, I'm paying more. But if my employer has 30 employees on it, I'm paying less. And vendor liability insurance is the same way. 30 producers are on the policy, it's cheaper for everyone. And often those um, vendor liability policies are underneath the co-op. Like you're a member of the co-op and then you have access to that insurance. Because every, you know, it's the way the world works, right? Everyone needs a little money. It still costs money for that insurance policy. So a membership in a co-op, you know, would be the, the small fee that would be the producers. Um, to that. So one of the other things we're working on within that, more specifically, is this feed goat market. So this is the online farmer's market that um, Lander Valley Farmer's Market is currently meeting that is going to be countywide. They're piloting just the Lander at first to work out the kinks and then expanding across the county. And right now it's not just Lander producers on that. You could be a producer anywhere in the county be on it, but they're looking at just doing sales in Lander because they need to figure out the irrigation and distribution of all that food, right? <laughs> and how, do, how does that work? So, you know, trying not to just sink right here at the launch, but starting small in Lander and then going out to other uh, communities. CWC's role in that is we were able to receive CARES Act grant funding to purchase uh, a reefer trailer, and that's just a um, gooseneck, a refrigerated and frozen trailer to help with cold stores that's also mobile. So that could go around and help deliver things between communities as well as service the stores. Because when Spark could be plugged in and then it's, you know, like, mobile deep freeze, right, or mobile refrigerator. And so that was a great, you know, political opinions are all very different these days, but that's a great use for CARES Act funding, in my opinion, right? It all helps out, and um, that vehicle was able to come through Central Lander College applying for that and, and getting that um, set up. And so it'll be uh, part of this distribution and irrigation network with Speed Goat Market. If you're all interested in getting involved with Speed Goat, uh, Lander Valley Farmers Market is the one who's the lead on it, how it well as a manager. Let me know if you want to talk to her, and I can get you connected with them. Uh, one of the things they're looking at, um, I mentioned tortillas earlier. There's a tortilla vendor in Lander, and he's also selling tortillas, so uh, this product's right there. Another group we're working with is more statewide. And we're, I've got a handout because this is really hard to read, I know, up here. Um, it's called Eat Wyoming, and they're headquartered in Casper, but they're looking at how to have hubs across the state and connect them all together. Because I'm sure all of you have been to Jackson, right? Jackson has a lot of opinions across the state about Jackson. But it also has a wealthier community. And their farmer's market, which they call the people's market, um, we were talking in the previous session how Lander often pays a little bit for farmer's market customers, maybe pay a little more for a product. Jackson people's market customers pay a lot more to the market. So a producer is looking to expand and increase their sales, selling at the Jackson People's Market can be really lucrative for them. And Teton County, you know, Jackson Hole, they don't have a lot of farmland there, right? It's, I think Teton County is like 95% public lands. They bring in a lot of their uh, food from Idaho. We love Idaho, but let's give them our food from Fremont County. And, you know, if you've been to Jackson, six hour round trip, that's it, you guys to the farmer's market over there, that could be, you know, more onerous for a producer to do that. So we're looking at how we can work with Eat Wyoming once we get the Fremont County um, 
distribution aggregation network set up through Speedgo and some other partners here, and perhaps through EYOMI connected to Jackson, connected to the Casper market, again, way more people, expanded um, markets for folks here in Fremont County that may really want your beef, lamb, your tortillas, <laughs> your tomatoes, and then you don't have to drive it. The producer doesn't have to drive it to Casper Jackson. It gets put on the EYOMI bus. Uh, this group already has um, a cold storage van, and they're already certified with the state. They have a thermometer. It's kept at the right temperature, and they um, are willing to take it through. Now, there is some fees that are outlined on that sheet. Uh, but there's some producers in Fremont County already doing it, and they figured it out. This saves them time, it saves them gas, and it's worth the, the transport fee to not have to go there. Unless you want to run errands in Casper and go to Home Depot, then you can do it. Um, or go eat Jackson, because they do have a lot of good restaurants. Another thing, restaurants in Jackson have a great wholesale market. So if you're looking at wholesale, there's a lot of restaurants there. Uh, about, you know, five million tourists go through Jackson every single summer, and they all eat. Uh, Brad referred to this, they love eating local th food, put some wild beef on the menu, they're going to order it. Um, I don't know if you know farmer Fred Gronke, who makes sauerkraut, he sells tons of kraut to Jackson. So they want kraut on their burger. Like there's all these different things you can do to participate in that. And one of the things that college is looking at is how do we help make more efficiency and cost effective in the system and helping more of the organization uh, level of it. Um, so that's a really quick rundown because Ethan also needs to speak and maybe we'll do questions. If I, can, I, I was remiss in not introducing our, our Dr. Uh, Mark Thardine, uh, uh, who's over, the dean over at Agnes. So I want to rather apologize, Mark, but yeah, so we got quite a few Agnes. Yeah, Agnes. Right. This is Ethan. Hey, everybody. Um, so, cool. So my name's Ethan. I'm the farm manager instructor for the Wind River Farm Business Incubator. Um, so I'm going to um, kind of give you a rundown of what an incubator program is, why we're creating one, um, sort of the cor course content location, and then the program dates. Um, so really, a farm incubator program is a nationally recognized program, and it's, it's been growing over the last five to ten years, where you connect small producers of fruit and vegetables with education and training um, to hopefully grow their business or get beginning farmers into um, into figuring out how to, to, to create their own business. So they're run by various organizations, um, and we're really the first one to launch in Wyoming. So obviously small farmers face a, a number of, of barriers to get started in this industry through education, financing, um, land, you know, your technical production skills, your business skills. Um, Incubators provide low-cost access to equipment and supplies, as well as you know the ability to lease plots of land um, at below market rates. So this is all really in the goal uh, of increasing availability of locally grown food and expand employment and business opportunities locally, of course. Um, so why are we creating this this program? Well, there's a, a few reasons. Um, isolated nature of this region means that a lot of produce is trucked in. Um, you know, that can be prone to disruptions from the weather or pandemics, obviously. A lot of supply chain problems happened last year with that. So um, we had farmers plowing in produce crops all over the country where, while people were needing food. So, um, you know, this is really uh, a way to bridge that gap, if you will, between um, those large scale distribution chains and, and keeping it local. Uh, sales of fresh produce in Landry Riverton are around $5 million a year as of 2018. So um, at the same time, that um, demand for locally grown produce has risen as well. So if you can capture, uh, like Brad said, a little bit of that market, that would have a, a big impact for local producers. Um, and there obviously is a lot more room for those, those local producers and growers, all in the goal, of course, of, of increasing, increasing the resilience of local economy by um, obviously developing more growers. So the program content, um, my program's going to be the, the crop production part, but um, it's going to provide overall technical and business training as well. Um, there's several course pathways, of course. We, we're keeping it very flexible, so we can do a variety of things based on participant needs. Um, 
Right now, we're going to do the hands-on crop production courses and the business course this year. And then once you develop a business plan within that business course, you can apply to NTR or incubator where you have access to land to resources um, so you can launch your own little business. Um, again, it's flexible based on what, what people want. Um, and of course, it's, it's, uh, the goal is to give participants a, um, a comprehensive education on all aspects of farm management because we all know that farmers are multiple professions rolled into one, so we try to hit all those aspects so um, we can you know, provide the best education possible and, and uh, really launch people into success with their own businesses. Um, so we are launching the, the course, um, the production courses at the Alpine Science Institute or the Sinks Canyon Center in Lander. We're gonna cultivate about a quarter acre there hopefully expand as the program expands. Uh, we have right now a uh, storage container with uh, cold storage in there. We've got a hoop house. We're gonna do a, um, a dome greenhouse as part of this, this course as well. And the, the production practicums run from the start of April to uh, start of October, you know, however long the, the growth of season goes. Um, and then the business course runs um, with the fall semester in August to, to October there. Um, so really, uh, the students this year at least are, are gonna be involved in the build out of the whole farm, so I think that's a really good opportunity for people that are interested in this to, to be, get that education from the ground up, if you will. Um, and it, of course, there's flexible training options, so if you just want the practicum, we can we can do that. If you just want the bit part of the business course, we can do that. If you want both, obviously, you can do that as well. And, and what we actually teach is, in the crop production, is um, flexible as well. So. You know, if you have a lot of experience doing one thing, we can gear it towards something else. Or, um, yeah, it's it's really uh, my goal as the manager and instructor is really to create a an engaging program that's fun to learn about how to grow food and and make it something that people enjoy and want to want to um, pursue. So uh, we do have financial aid and housing available too if, if if there's interest for that. So yeah, if you have any um, questions about it or anything else we've talked about. Feel free to ask or come chat with us. Yeah, so we went a million miles an hour because we didn't know exactly which direction everyone wants to go. But there's a whole lot more that could be said to Colin. You probably heard from Melissa that we're trying to get grants in kind of catalytic areas like the cold storage, you know, reaper, reaper unit, and trying to look at kind of the whole kind of supply chain where we need workforce and where we need infrastructure and where we need kind of establish market, you know, whether it's online or else, and there's a whole lot. I think Melissa was saying that probably on, from tourists alone in Fremont County, what was the numbers, like how much do they spend? In Fremont County, I believe there's 40 million a year that is spent on food. Hmm. The state tracks this. So right. grocery stores and restaurants, to our, I don't know how they track it, but they've got a whole report called Travel Impacts Wyoming, if you yeah. Google it. Um, and it was 40 million in Fremont County. Of course, Teton is like 300. Yeah. And what we've learned too in Teton County, the, the Park Service has this kind of first right of refusal kind of language that the parks are really supposed to buy local if they can, if you can meet their quality and the quantity, you know, that's part of this. And so there's this huge potential. You see it all around us, right? And so we're trying to, to plug into those p p potentials, but it, um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to be adjust the market and provide opportunities in, in strategic ways. And what we have access to is a lot of times is grant money. So we think, okay, what do we need? What does this whole, this whole market need? And so I mean, you can see we're doing a whole lot of different stuff, but it's very holistic, right? So, and, we're, and to me, and I think for us, local food is not a cute little thing. It's like back in the day, you made more money because you, you got more revenue rather than just selling the raw product. Is we're trying to crack that open, and I think it, it, it's going to go there. If you think about it, um, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, you couldn't get a fancy cup of coffee anywhere, right? And now it's just everything's gourmet coffee. 20 years ago, all the beer was like Coors and Miller, and now there's everything under the sun, and people like craft beer, craft coffee. And now it's like it's shifted. Now people are saying, I'll pay more for food. And so what we're trying to do is get maybe 15, 20% of all food production in the stores and restaurants to be local. Why not? It was that way 100 years ago, more now. Why can't we do that? 
it's different, right? And so, yeah, and it implies a, a premium cost, but as incomes rise in nations of the world, money does shift towards more premium products, right? People buy better wine, better beer, better coffee. And so the time has come for food, and, and we gotta help Penny Mill know that, right? So you ask anything you want, from meats to fruits to vegetables. I don't think you talk about fruit too much, but. What is your um, craft meats program stuff? You, you dealt a lot with the vegetable side of things. Uh, I know a lot of us are ranchers in here. That's sure. Where I fish the cattle. And I think last year we hit that hard, but that was fun. I would, we'd like to talk, talk about that. And so we're very delighted to have Amanda Winchester as our, our meat faculty. I think you've been on the job. Are you officially on the job yet? I signed my contract yesterday. Okay, so <laughs> brand spanking new. And so, um, so what we have in that regard, we got a Wyoming's Works grant that we got to purchase a mobile slaughter unit, which is really instructional. It's not like you go out and you can handle one or two head a day or something, right? So it's very much instructional. And then we partnered with two other colleges uh, at Eastern Wyoming and, and a college in Sheridan. And, um, and then with CARES money, we got a mobile cut and wrap. So we can kind of do even that, because it's one thing to slaughter. But then you got to take that quartered animal or half animal somewhere, right? So now we have a place that we can take them right then and there, show you how to cut it up, where any parts of your meat, and do all. Um, so we're hoping that part of the operation we can get, get all the approvals. You know, we need to be, you know, state inspected, USDA or um, custom exempt. You have to get those approvals. So we're aiming at summer to actually have something kind of go in there. And then the permanent facility would be like a year, two years later with the Rocky Mountain Complex with facilities in there. But, um, so that's where we are with the meats and it's very much, um, Mark Nordin set up the curriculum that it's 15 credits basically, but somebody doesn't need the whole thing, right? It's meant to be very quick in, quick out, you know, a couple months, pan a ton of knowledge, have people working with our mobile unit or, or, or local producers such as, you know, Bo over there to really try to be there to meet that that workforce need. And um, so we're super excited because it, it would be the only one in the state really. UW is a beautiful facility, but they don't really crank out practitioners at all. And some schools, one or two, I think Northwest dabbles conceptually in meats, but this is gonna be get your hands bloody and teach it with craft beef, because people aren't just like, they don't want to just, you know, in a chicken factory cranking up, they want the craft of it all, and, and specialty cuts and whatnot, so we're excited with that. But hopefully this, I don't know, it's hard to promise because things approval stick longer than you think, but hopefully in the next couple months, hopefully we'll be able to be offering some things. So with your mobile slaughter, you guys didn't have like for even aged beef also before? You want, you want to yeah, we, we have a um, freezer unit then once we, we slaughter them and hang them and then we have a freezer unit that you can then hang it to age it and then we can process it and cut it up. So I think that the main thing right now is that we'll have the capability to yeah. go in and, you know, say somebody has, you know, 10 pigs in, at their place and they can't get into the main slaughter places. We can bring the mobile unit to them, we can process them and then hang them in the the cold refrigerator storage until we, you know, a week later we can cut them off. And so, you know, we're just adding to the local um, processors to give small producers a little bit of things or kids in 4-H that, you know, have an extra animal that needs processed but can't get until January. So we're just trying to help with the, the um, local industry but not take over for them and, and train those workers then in the process to be able to go in the local industry to add more to it. Is that something that you envision running year round or just no, it'll be, when it hits that part of the course you do it? And no, it, it'll be, um, I have a 11 month contract. So um, I don't know when I'll have students totally yet. I mean, we don't have that part brought out, but so I'll be more available than just, you know, August. May so um, I really want to use it as a teaching to be able to do that as far as cattle we'll have to quarter it to hang it in there the, the mobile
normal trailer is too short to hang it, you know, whole, which is fine. You can do whatever. Yeah, but, <laughs> but that's the process that, I, that I understand the goal now. to be. So. Another potential to mobile slaughtering unit in other states, and specifically in Hawaii, which has a huge meat processing bottleneck, you know, they're an island, right? There's actually quite a bit of range in Hawaii. Uh, but they have producer co-ops that own mobile slaughtering units, and then they hire the butcher within the co-op, and then producers, you know, get on a schedule, they help out, but that butcher goes around with the unit, and then that's like the, the business. And so within, for the college's unit, is purpose is more educational, but it's a great on-farm model to, for folks who are interested in something like that to go, oh, let me go learn with this, because you might end up really hating it, right? I can butcher a chicken. I've never butchered a cow, and I don't want to. Uh, you know, and you have to, on-farm processing, you have to be a part of the process. And to see if, you know, it's something that um, a group of ranchers and um, even land ranchers as well would want to support here, and then perhaps uh, once you learn more about the unit, you know, folks are like, yes, we, you know, we went through the process, we see the seed unit, I'm totally on board with this. Hey, who else is with me, neighbors? Let's get one of our own, and perhaps at that point, too, the college could assist with, um, there's, this grant funding is open to the college, it's not open to um, some other individuals, so perhaps we can also assist in, you know, putting together that type of thing in the future. And they have to be careful, right? The, especially with both, I don't ever want to make you nervous, so kind of our model is, you don't want to hurt business, you're trying to spur it, right? So you have to kind of have your foot carefully, you know, on, on the gas, right? Because you're trying to think, as I understand, there's this big bottleneck, right? So there's kind of more things that we could do, you know, process a couple animals because there's not an opportunity, but maybe 10 hogs and, and Bo says, I can't get it. Now Frank says, I can't get it. So yeah, go ahead, because otherwise, in Catholic College, they send their sheep to Colorado, which is like a crying shame, right? But so as we build capacity, the college, He's kind of in their producing workforce, but there might be opportunities where if there's too much of a, of a market backlog and people are saying, I can't grow, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, we can slaughter and store other instructional things. So we, we were careful with these things, but I think it's good to think of a statewide on this because no one else really is taking this niche for the state on the, you know, the college side of the seven community colleges. And so having that mobile slaughter and um, processing, I think, I can imagine it being shared in for three months or stuff like that, too. How much interest do you have in your small farm operators you said, like, for students? Yeah, it's been good so far. Um, we've kind of, we've gotten the word out in the college unit and did a lot of that um, just to gauge interest and to get people, you know, interested. And um, now we've got, we've got a little bit of interest coming, but obviously always actively recruiting students um, and looking for them to, to start up with us in the spring. So, you know, that's part of why we're doing this event today to get the word out. Um, and we've, we've started in, in January doing a little more. So, yeah, there's a, a little bit out there, but we're trying to drum it up. You're planning on doing it starting this spring here? Yeah, yeah, we're planning to, to, to break ground and, and plow at least probably in March. And then the, the production course starts um, April 5th. So, yeah. So any thoughts or ideas you have, let any of us know because it is complex, right? Because people will say, someone approached me saying they want to participate on a beef roundup that we did last, when did we do it last fall? August. August. And then a lot of people across the state, it was really great. We had, you know, meat sampling and it was a great activity. And at least one rancher came up to me and said, I can't finish locally, I'd love to play in that space. But what you guys need to do is like Montana State University and help us, you know, find places to finish locally and then some sort of a finance thing where you get some of the money now like you would have gotten from the cow calf operation a bit more. So we're looking at all sorts of things because we're looking at this giant supply chain scratching our head. And so, and there's complexity every step of the way, right? In terms of, you know, grazing and everything. And so this isn't easy, but someone's got to try I mean, it shifted one way, it can shift shift back, but the whole intention is trying to get more of a dollar, instead of getting a third of a dollar, I mean, one third of the value of the cow, you get two thirds or something. You know, so it's not so, such a hard life and you get you know, more revenue. So we're trying to, trying to help in all these different spaces and people coming forward and saying, 
hey, could you help with this aspect of it? We're all ears, you know. And then luckily, like you said, we can go for grants. And I said, oh, shoot, you know. Um, we might be able to, to, to do something to help that part of that, the, the supply chain. You see, we're kind of all over the place, but we're really trying to, to shift things. And I think also from um, Joanne and uh, Ethan's incubator farm, is that we also know that we need farm managers, right? Because these people are retiring and ranch managers. And so it could be that these people come out and say, okay, I'm all trained and ready to go and interested. And then, then they say, well, let's make a deal. What does this look like? You know, maybe it's not completely buying it, but maybe it's leasing it for cheap. Or maybe they just become the farm manager and live the life they wanted to, but it's not their land. You know, we just have to make inroads on that. So we do plan to have the, 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 the beef roundup. I think we had our first conversation about getting that going again. Hopefully some of you attended. That was great. We had got to take sampling from, I think it was 10 different steaks, and you had to choose which one you liked the best. Yeah. And that was a wonderful going up. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it'll be more wonderful next year. Um, yeah, so for your beef and producers, let's know if you want to be part of the roundup. It's here in Riverton. 